Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jocelyn Munguia, program coordinator over at the Latino Cultural Center. Thank you for joining us for today's program. Uh, before we get started, I would like to do a quick access check. Let us know if our audio is okay with a thumbs up or reaction button with for the panelists and uh, over on the chat for those attending. Also, let us know if you are able to access the live caption button on the Zoom. If you have any questions about accessibility during our program, please message us and we'll guide you through that process. Also, this program, as you noticed, is being recorded. And so please be mindful of the virtual space and use the chat for comments or questions and we'll try to get to them toward the end of the program. We also would like to acknowledge that the University of Illinois at Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. The area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. The state of Illinois is currently home to more than 100,000 tribal members with the Chicago land area being the home of one of the largest and most diverse urban native communities in the US. By making a land acknowledgement, we recognize that indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy, live, living here long before Chicago was a city and are still thriving today. As we work, live and play on these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization and state violence and support indigenous communities struggles for self-determination and sovereignty. Thank you. I will now pass it over to our center director who will give you a warm welcome. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Rosa Cabrera, uh, director of the UIC Rafael Cintron or Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, better known as the LCC. Uh, thank you for joining us in the LCC Climates of Inequality online series. Um, in the fall of 2020, uh, the series presented local leaders working on environmental and climate justice in the Chicago area. And you can find those presentation videos in the uh, LCC website, which I believe um, they are putting in on the chat right now. Um, and this fall, the series is extending the conversation to environmental and climate justice champions from across the country and abroad. Guest speakers have and will be sharing frameworks and solutions that utilize a justice and equity lens, integrating social and economic issues to address address toxic pollution and combat the climate crisis that is causing greater health and economic risk to Blacks, Indigenous, people of colors, and in particular women, the very old and young, and the LGBTQ disabled and undocumented communities. Environmental champions have advocated for decades that the well-being of working people need to join forces with the fight to protect the well-being of our planet. In today's presentation, we will hear about a transformative framework called Just Transition, which demand uh, that a healthy economy and a clean environment must coexist. Emerging from labor unions and environmental justice groups, just Transition recognizes the need to phase out harmful industries and transition to a clean and equitable energy future. This is precisely where environmental justice and labor justice converge to ensure that this future leaves no workers behind. Before we start the presentation, uh, a few shout outs are in order uh, to our partners the Humanities Action Lab, where the Climates of Inequality Project resides, and organizations Alianza Americas and Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, known as El Vejo. To our co-sponsors, the UIC Sustainability Fee, 
uh, the Global Migration Working Group, Latin American and Latino Studies, Social Justice Initiative, Department of Anthropology, CIMAS Project, Freshwater Lab, Great Cities Institute, Honors College, Las Ganas Project, and Museums and Exhibition Studies. And to the students panelists in my environmental and climate justice class, uh, Rosalinda Almanza, Charlotte Glaser, Benjamin Mark Manaman, and Erica Schop. The presentation will be about 30 minutes or so, followed by a short conversation between uh, these students and our guest speakers. Um, and now I am delight, uh, delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Jose Bravo, who is a longtime leader on just transition, climate justice and chemicals policy as they relate to communities fighting for environmental justice and labor justice, both organized and unorganized. Jose was born in Mexico and brought to the US as a child. His work in social justice issues is rooted in his upbringing in the Southern California avocado fields alongside both his parents. Since 1991, Jose has gained recognition as a national and international leader in both the environmental justice and climate justice movement. Over the past 30 years as a community organizer, Jose has worked on numerous campaigns, campaigns in the US, Puerto Rico, and in Mexico. He's currently getting ready to attend the 26th UN Climate Change Conference in Scotland uh, at the end of this month. So we're very lucky that he's giving us time to uh, be with us today. I believe that uh, he will tell us um, about his role uh, in the conference in a little bit. So, uh, so welcome, Jose. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure talking to folks from UIC. I, I know that uh, we participated in several other activities with UIC, and we have one coming up as well um, through the Great Cities Institute where women of color uh, that were part of the first People of Color Environmental Justice uh, Summit. We'll be talking about the last 30 years. This is the 30th anniversary. So folks are invited to that as well. And it's a project of, uh, well, it's co-sponsored by the Just Transition Alliance and then the Greater Cities Institute as well. So thank you. I had to throw in that plug while people are, 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 um, are listening at this moment. So, um, the I'll, I'll 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 start out by saying that you know i'm i come out as you heard as you know from the farm worker community and growing up in a farm worker community especially in the late 60s early 70s um, we had a very different approach on toxics you know and I'll, I'll explain more when my father would put me on top of a 500 a uh, gallon um, trailer that was pulled by a tractor spraying pesticides. That was my daycare. That was my daycare because there was no other daycare accessible to farm worker families. And when my father would need some kind of chemical, um, he would say in Spanish, traeme la medicina, which means bring me the medicine. Uh, the medicine was poison. <laughs> and for us, it, we had a different perspective on, on what it did. Uh, we thought that it made the yields better. It got rid of pests. It, it did other things that, um, but little did we know that we were harming Mother Earth and ourselves as well by spreading these pesticides in these fields. And, you know, when we talk about knowing what you're putting on the planet, knowing what you're pu putting on the Earth, we had no idea. We had no idea that these um, chemicals that we were spreading um, literally um, would bind to our bodies. And, you know, for many farm workers um, later on in life would manifest as cancer, as many other things as we're seeing with Roundup and glyphosate at the moment. <clears throat> but I just wanted to make sure that people understood 
that that's that was my upbringing and then you know as i went to san diego state university to study biology i studied biology at san diego state and i started seeing you know there is a correlation around a lot of things that we were doing that were harming the planet harming the biology of this mother earth and you know i got involved in the environmental justice movement early on in 1990 1990 and i went to the first people of color summit in 1991 as a 25 year old um, that was not only working on um, environmental issues environmental justice issues we didn't call it that then uh, but we we were working also on immigrant issues i live here in san diego and we had a lot of situations where you know immigrants were being killed and shot and persecuted on the mexico us border so as students at san diego state we also participated in a lot of uh, the uh you know safeguarding immigrants from um some of these things so i mean to say all this because our environment is very much differently defined than mainstream environmental groups uh, mainstream environmental groups for instance will go to a field and do a massive study on the impacts of pesticides on the on a snail darter which is a bird um, and would not think twice about doing that same study on children that live right next to that field and are impacted by either um, overspray of pesticides by contaminated water by what their parents are bringing into their homes on their clothing other things like that so the environmental justice movement looks at where we live where we live where we work where we play where we study and i will add where we cross the border um, so a lot of a lot of that what i'm talking about and what you'll hear today is just about how that definition was really put to, to, to fruition in the First People of Color Summit when we put together what are called the 17 Principles for Environmental Justice. There's a document that you can reach on Google. Um, it's, it was put together during the First People of Color Summit in 1991. And you'll start seeing that that document has really, for, for people that, that that we're coming from that point of view, it, it really encompasses a lot more than just the flora and the fauna, which are important and part of an ecosystem that we need to protect, but we also need to protect those that are most vulnerable. One of the things that we saw in the environmental justice movement um, through a book called Waste and Race in the United States was that um, if you took a map of the United States and you put in where the heaviest concentrations of people of color or poor people are, and then you took another map with the heaviest concentrations of unwanted um, chemical trespass per se, toxic waste dumps, uh, incinerators, um, heavy industry, uh, no zoning, <laughs> all those things come to play when we're talking about the impacts on communities of color and low income communities. So you take that second map and you put it on the first one and they're identical. Most of the heavy industry is in our communities. We have literally borne the, the disproportionate impact of dirty energy. So we have lived the legacy since the industrial revolution and probably before some, some of my brothers and sisters in the indigenous world would say that we've been living that for 500 plus years um, in regards to the impact of um, different things that have made our communities um, vulnerable. Um, so that's the environmental justice side of things. That's where I come from. And in 1997, we got invited to Chicago of all places, right? Uh, to a meeting by the OCAW, which was the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. The Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union made everything from a little BB or a BB gun to a nuclear weapon and 90,000 chemicals as well. So they, there was a very forward thinking person by the name of Tony Mazaki that was part of the OCAW. 
who came up with the, an understanding or basically the theory and the practice behind the just transition. And what he used to tell us was that the OCAW makes things that probably do not belong on the face of the planet. And at some point we would need to phase these things out. So how could we get in front of that curve and start addressing the issues of displacement of work, um, of, of making sure that while we were saying no more DDT, what would happen to the workers that made DDT, right? Um, so they, they, they came up with this thing called the Superfund for Workers, where they wouldn't wanted to tax every gallon of unsustainable product or chemical um, so that there be a fund for workers to transition into a safer, more, uh, you know, less polluting process or job. And um, so that was really good. And when we came together in, in Chicago, we said, hey, wait, but you're now talking to folks from the environmental justice movement um, where we've lived the legacy of what you produce. You're at the front line of exposure. So if there's an explosion, you as workers suffer immediate loss. But that chain link fence at the, you know, on the side of DuPont chemical or whatever it be, isn't gonna protect our communities and hasn't protected our communities. So for us, it's imperative that workers inside that community, inside that, that job site, inside that industry are safe because if workers are safe, that means we're gonna be safe as well. But it isn't just about putting um, a hard hat on a worker or a mask on a worker. It's about designing the danger out of a process or a chemical to make it so that it doesn't impact our communities and workers. So that was kind of like the idea behind just transition. And then they said, well, you know, one of the agreements that we have to make is that you won't be able to, you will no longer be able to pick it outside some of the plants that we represent or the plants that we represent as labor. And we said, well, in that case, then you have to give up your right to strike. So when unionized workers <laughs> look at the right to strike, it's a fundamental right, just, that it, just as it is a fundamental right for us to protect our communities in, which, in whichever way we need to, in this case, direct action, doing blockades, uh, putting people in front of harm's way when, <clears throat> when trucks are coming down the street and, and you know, stopping what's, what's uh, causing us um, harm. So moving forward, I think that, you know, we, we, we decided to move towards signing a, what's called um, a, um, a mutual understanding agreement that at least we would inform each other. Uh, if we were gonna have an action outside a plant that was represented by the OCAW, we would, ask our brothers and sisters in the OCW to join us, but at least inform them, but to join us and understand why we were gonna have that action. And in essence, literally most of the time, if not all of the time, it was about health and safety, both to workers and the community. So the Just Transition Alliance was formed in 1997 and we had five sites. We had uh, Ponca City, Oklahoma with the Ponca tribe, we had San Antonio, Texas, Rillito, Arizona, Oakland, California, around the Richmond sites. And then um, we had uh, McIntosh, Alabama. Um, in McIntosh, Alabama, Alabama, that was like the most difficult site for us because there, the local was very few people and the community was really, really devastated. I mean, we had community members uh, walk us through uh, some of the forest around some of the plants and they could literally turn leaves up with the stick, turn a, a several leaves over and you could see um, mercury. Mercury that just straight up on the, on the ground there, how it, been, it had been dumped there by the plants. Um, so uh, we worked these sites. We, we tended to pick a site where there was an environmental justice organization and some worker issue, such as collective bargaining issues, such as lockouts, or such as health and safety concerns within the plant, so that we all had something in common. 
and we could help each other navigate through a just transition process. So moving forward, <laughs> um, the OCAW um, was merged by the paper union and the OCAW became PACE, the Paper Allied Chemical and Industrial Energy Workers. Um, so when it merged with the PACE workers, it became a little bit more conservative. Uh, actually, the OCAW was not a conservative union. It was literally a left of center. And then when it merged with the paper, we started hearing from the vice presidents, well, we can't talk about the dioxin in rivers because we represent paper plants and we don't want to mess with jobs and you know uh, reduce the amount of dioxin that these companies are putting in rivers. A lot of those rivers flowing into uh, waterways, just like in the waterway and that you all live in in Chicago or where the university is located. Um, so, um, to, to the, I think the saving grace was that it didn't, pace didn't last long. It lasted maybe a year, two years. And uh, then the old OCAW pace then was um, merged into what is now the United Steelworkers. Uh, so the United Steelworkers, its real name is the United Steelworkers Paper and Energy Workers of America. Um, but you mostly hear the United Steel work with them. So we've been working with locals ever since our inception. We have really good working relationships with labor locals. If you don't understand what a labor local is, the labor local is actually the, 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 the union hall in your community. Um, that's the labor local. We don't do as much work with the international because as you'll hear, we're having some communication or, or some problems with um, agreeing on, on climate issues um, with labor. Um, I, I sit on, a, on an advisory capacity to a, a group that advises the White House. And part of that is environment. My role there is environmental justice and just transition. And labor sits on that. And what we've started to hear from our brothers and sisters in the international world, like the AFL-CIO and others, are that they support things like carbon capture. Um, they support what's called green hydrogen. Um, they support other things that might be detrimental and have proven detrimental to our communities. So we have to have that discussion with our brothers and sisters. So to that, we are taking a, a delegation of workers to the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework on Climate Change in Glasgow, Scotland. And our goal is for these workers to talk to other workers around the world so that they can see how they've managed through dialogue and other things with the governments and with the industries to move away from fossil fuels such as coal, and, and other um, hazardous fossil fuels into more of a re renewable energy economy. So that's our goal for the, for the COP meeting this time around. And some of us, very few of us because of COVID uh, were given um, passes or actually what's called um, a participant uh, badge to be able to go into the negotiations of the UNFCCC or the United Nations Framework on Climate. Um, I say all this because there is this whole idea that um, if we control the environment, we would, uh, in essence, uh, be combating um, climate change. For us, that's a major false solution. And what has happened by controlling the environment is this, and you've probably heard about this. It's called carbon trading. And in many of our communities like South Central Los Angeles where the first ever carbon trading mechanism was put in place, it didn't work. Um, and you know, our brothers and sisters in Canada, we work, we work with the Canadian energy and paper workers as well, um, have seen carbon capture, processes put in, in place and 
those union brothers will say, and sisters will say that it hasn't worked. Um, but what does work? Well, first of all, what does work is like having to really dig down deep and say, stop using fossil fuels. That's basically what it would take at the moment. Um, and that's easier said than done. We understand that. But we haven't even had a conversation around phasing out fossil fuels. Um, we've had a conversation about fossil fuel emissions and other things like that, but not the use of fossil fuels in the sense of, you know, we're trying to figure out every other way that we can do something, but not stop using fossil fuels. Um, so carbon capture, you know, other things, other mechanisms, cap and trade. So it seems to me that people need to understand that if you live in um, Richmond, California, uh, that is surrounded by refineries and your, your community has a high incidence, by the way, of asthma, breathing uh, problems and other things like that, it seems to me that a company buying credits in order to pollute even more there, but plant trees in South America is not a win-win situation for that community of Richmond. So that's what's happening with carbon trading. Um, there's the shifting of burden by the industrialized nations, the rich nations, um, literally what is called the global south. And when we have meetings or when we attend meetings like this UN meeting in, in, in Glasgow, we bring the perspective from the south within the north. That means that our communities, those systems of exploitation that that uh, the developed nations have put in place um, that were honed in our communities are now being globalized. So our communities are like the South part of the planet, uh, but within the North. Um, so that's the big conversation, right? And then, um, you know, the, the 900 pound gorilla, there's probably four 900 pound gorillas that are gonna show up in Glasgow, Scotland. One is the US, other one is China, the other one is Russia, and the other one is India. So those four countries have probably more carbon emissions than most of the other countries put together. Um, so again, what are those four countries gonna do? <laughs> Well, what's happening is that those are the four countries that are pushing all these false solutions, right? In order for them to maintain the level of energy consumption instead of energy reduction that is needed through fossil fuels. So, you know, it puts us within a quandary, right? Because I was just on a conference call, Kayla and I were just on a conference call listening to people from like Tuvalu and folks in the Pacific Islands, that their islands are already submerging because of, of sea level rise um, and have the least amount to do with carbon emissions than almost anybody else on the planet. So they're paying for that again, that the, the, the fact that countries like the US and the four 900 pound gorillas um, don't want to reduce the amount of carbon emissions, literally don't want to, but they will offset things. You know, you can probably, it gets to the point that it's kind of almost ludicrous, right? Um, you can go on a flight from one place to another in the United States, and you're given the option to plant a tree to offset the amount of carbon it took you to go from point A to point B. That, in essence, is a false solution. Why? Because um, where is that fuel that that jet, you know, where is that jet A fuel uh, made? It's made in communities of color. Where is it stored? It's stored in communities of color. And ultimately, when there's disasters, where do those disasters occur? Back in our communities, right? So we have to, as a whole, I think, think a little bit deeper and a just transition for us would be 
of developing cradle to cradle economies. That means that whatever we produce gets repurposed into something else or something that um, again makes uh, sense. Um, we live in a society right now where there's this piece called, there, there's this theory called design obsolescence. I don't know if some of you have heard of that, but design obsolescence means that this phone here um, will be obsolete pretty soon. And, and somebody's going to start sending me uh, some kind of ads or some kind of offers to buy a new phone. Why? Because it now has better camera or it, it doesn't, or now it takes, you know, uh, has more data or other things of, of like that. So the reason why that is so horrid is because we lost touch with the fact that this should just be a phone. It does everything for us now, right? And it's it it, it for me it, I I call it my electronic leash because I can't it, it literally is with me and people can communicate with me via text, via email. You know, you all know. <laughs> I'm sure that you're living that experience as well. But the design obsolescence piece is super important to understand. It was made. It it, it literally was a science that was developed right after the Second World War. Uh, where we needed to start producing more things quickly. Um, and because we needed to bring the economy up, the war ended, so that war economy was going ending. So as a result, uh, the design of the, the implementation of design obsolescence became um, very much needed, according to those folks that, that live in the capitalist processes that make money from us. You might remember or you might hear once in a while that, you know, an older person saying, oh, man, I remember those toasters. I mean, I remember that toaster since I was a little kid. Well, yeah, because first of all, it costs a lot of money, <laughs> and but it was designed to last. Things aren't designed to last anymore. Uh, same with cars and same with other things. But we need to look at that. There's a, there's a, um, a video that I would ask you to look at. It's called, um, uh, let me see, uh, The Story of Stuff. It's put on by a good friend of mine. She's now the head of Greenpeace USA. And um, she um, literally talks about how design obsolescence and then tracks like how things are mined and how things are done and and it comes back and then ultimately it lands back in that um, waste pile back in whose community? People of color, low-income communities. So let's start thinking out of the box, right? When we're, when we're looking at cars, and I see this right here. Um, so yeah, Google is an example, right? Because they fix old cars and they keep old cars running for 50, 60 years. That's important but that's because of necessity, right? Because, you know, there's other political things going on with Cuba that, that necessity, gives the necessity for that to happen. But here in the United States, let's talk about here in the United States. In the United States, um, right now, everybody wants to see what the new Tesla is gonna look like, what the new hybrid car is gonna look like, what the new electric car, you know, Hardly anybody's really, and look at commercials, by the way, look at commercials, even for conventional cars. They no, they no longer mention mileage. So you could buy a Dodge Ram truck because now it has a step side to it and all kinds of things, but it doesn't tell you that it only gets nine miles per gallon, right? And why? Because they don't want to have people be conscious about mileage all the time. And they don't want you to pressure the auto industry to start making cars that give you more mileage per gallon of fuel. Now, when we're talking about electric cars, there's this whole other thing that we, we were warned about. And I said, we were warned about it in, in actually in Brazil when some scientists came and talked to us about this whole greening of the economy, right? And they said, it's going to be a green bubble. 
is going to be something that, you know, we should all jump on, but at the same time, make sure that we have some control over. Why? Because Tesla needs lithium. <laughs> and if you remember, probably a couple of years ago, there was a coup attempt in Bolivia. It wasn't because of Evo Morales. It was because Bolivia has a major, major store of lithium. And US and other world economies wanted that lithium in Bolivia. Uh, the same thing is happening here on Shoshone land. And part of why I think it's, it's important is because you have to look at these cars need batteries, right? And nobody's thinking about where are those batteries gonna get recycled? Our communities. Where are all those junkyards going to be once other folks get rid of their Teslas? Our communities, right? Because they're not designed for years and years and years, right? A battery life for a Tesla, I think, is like seven or eight years. Um, they won't tell you that offhand, but that's about what I think the, the battery life is. And what, I, what we're saying in the Just Transition is think deeper, think harder, think more in depth about how you build things, right? We should not be building, literally, we should not be building um, single family vehicles anymore. We should be building what's called a mass transit infrastructure that gets people from point A to point B in good time that's accessible. We should retool Detroit to become the world mass transit, uh, you know, uh, non-polluting mass transit hub. I mean, Detroit was retooled during the second world war. I don't know if you got that in your history thing, but uh, Detroit during the second world war was retooled to the point where it made tanks, it made jeeps, it made airplanes, it made cannons, it made all kinds of things and it stopped making cars. That's why you don't see too many cars from 41 to 45, right? You see the 50s and you see the 30s uh, in regards to cars. So, because again, Detroit shifted its purpose. There was an all out call, call out for, you know, um, the war effort and Detroit. I think we should take that same approach with this climate crisis that we're in the process of seeing. Um, I think that Detroit should be retooled. Re Detroit should be reawoken. <laughs> um, and any administration that comes to power should be putting a lot of money into creating the infrastructure that we're going to need in order to do things the right way. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm just, that's an example of a just transition away from just the single-minded or single-family uh, vehicles towards more of an inclusive um, mass transit uh, economy, if you want to say it to scale, if, if need be. And the other thing that I, I do have to say is that now that I talked about economies, um, I remember during 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement, there was politicians up and down here in San Diego telling us how NAFTA was going to be the boom for us, that we were going to make so much money from NAFTA, that we were, the NAFTA was going to, and basically what NAFTA set up was Mexico being the, the, the mano de obra, the, 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 how would you say mano de obra in English? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the, the assembly plant for major corporations. They didn't, they're not leaving much behind in Mexico. Salaries? No. Infrastructure? No. Um, so NAFTA hasn't benefited us at all. In, in regards to people that work here on the Mexico-US border, it hasn't. So globalized economies, I think we need to move away from globalized economies to regional and local economies to scale. And I'll tell you how fickle our economy is and the global economy is. A ship ran aground probably three or four months ago in the Suez Canal, and it literally impacted 14% of the global economy. One ship ran sideways in a river, in a canal, 
and it affected the planet. So I think, and who pays for that? Do you think the billionaires pay for that? Billionaires have been making money. They, they've made money, you know, hand over hand um, lately to the, the point where, you know, they're all going into outer space now. Um, but I just gotta say, at some point, we have to look at globalized economies. We have to produce what we use, community gardens. We need food security. We need water security. Um, with this climate crisis, uh, oil, I don't think is gonna be the next war. I'll tell you what I think is gonna be the next war, securing water. Uh, I live out here in the West Coast and some of you have probably heard you know, that we're in a, in a deep water crisis because again, we've seen the hottest summers, we've seen a bunch of weather related things that have caused us to go into like, oh, now let's think about it mode. So thank you. And I hope uh, that was um, fruitful. <laughs> Thank you, Jose, so much. Uh, we're going to um, open this up for the, the student panelists now to um, ask you questions. And uh, also um, uh, people are putting some uh, questions and uh, comments on the chat. And I think that Jorge will facilitate that as well. So ECJ students, uh, go for it, please. Thank you, Rosa, and thank you, Jose. Um, I was really interested when you uh, were talking about the the four 900 pound gorillas, the four biggest kind of polluter economies that we have. And I guess I was wondering what your opinion was on if these four nations should be at the forefront of addressing climate change, or if because of their role as possibly the biggest, as the biggest polluters, they've maybe lost their seat at the table and need to give up their positions to these nations that have are more affected by climate change? Yeah, I, I think they should be at the forefront. They should be leading the way. They owe the planet what is called a carbon debt. Um, and right now you can look at the carbon debt in several ways. You can look at it monetarily or you can look at it from a point of view of carbon reduction, right? In the United States, I think the Biden administration where you know, we've been having conversations with the Biden administration around this and John Kerry and other folks that are now the, the climate czars and stuff. Um, we said that, you know, the Biden administration pushing out, you know, a 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 is not enough. That the, the countries, the underdeveloped countries, in order for it to be a climate equity thing, um, would need at least 70 to 90% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. So that's one, one way. I think the other pieces are that the, the United States, the, the four 900 pound gorillas need to uh, donate money or put money into shoring up countries like Tuvalu and the South Pacific and other places that are already seeing the climate crisis because of their excessive amount of carbon emissions, right? It's not their fault, it's the countries, the, the guerrilla countries, <laughs> we'll just call it that. Uh, and uh, so there is conversation gonna happen in, in Glasgow. Uh, we do have a position on how that money has to be used because we don't want any of that money um, to go towards false solutions, right? Um, you know, they're saying carbon capture. No, we're saying leave it in the ground. They're saying, you know, uh, the hydrogen economy. We're saying, wait, wasn't the Hindenburg full of hydrogen? Is that what you want to put next to a hospital in my community? Right? In whose community are you going to put the hydrogen storage facilities? So we have to have those discussions. And I think it's important for us to, to push back on this administration and other administrations. You know, I remember not a lot of people know this, but I remember during the Kyoto Protocol, who was the person that was going around in Kyoto asking not to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol? 
Mr. Climate Change himself, Mr. Al Gore. He was the person that was saying, wait, we got to think about our economy first instead of about our environment and what we're doing. And now he's become one with climate. Well, to bounce off of this, first of all, thank you for all this information. Um, at the beginning, Rosa said that you were attending uh, the UN meeting in Scotland. And I was just wondering what will be your role there? What, what do you think you'll do? So um, we have what's called an inside outside strategy. Um, so our inside strategy will be to put pressure on the countries to actually do something that's meaningful that will get us down to uh, 1.5 or less uh, degrees Celsius um, and not go the route of maintaining the level of carbon emissions by planting trees in the global south. When I say planting trees, that it's not that simple. I, I say planting trees. What happens with the UN process right now is that they have um, a process that literally looks at rainforest, looks at forested areas, looks at deforestation and degradation, they call it. Um, and they plant trees there. But you know, the problem with that is that they also kick indigenous people off their lands. Lands that they've they've been stewards of for thousands of years in the global south so it's literally become a land grab and the leaders of the land grab are world wildlife fund and the nature conservancy so they're in cahoots with the governments to take those lands and we want to be able to go to them and say hey stop we've been telling them to stop for 10 years but they haven't been listening so that's on the inside as well. We're gonna have that strategy on the inside as well as the outside. Um, on the outside, from our delegation's point of view, we're bringing rank and file workers. A rank and file worker is the person that actually pushes the buttons or moves the lever and starts the process going inside a plant. Uh, it could be a chemical plant, it could be a refinery, it could be where for this year, we're taking folks that are in the, that are um, that are stewardesses and stewards in, in airline companies, right? Why? Because they need to be able to push their companies to do the right thing from within as well, right? Um, so the outside strategy is gonna be to expose these workers from the United States to other countries that already have uh, just transition mechanisms in place so that they can learn from them, they can ask them the question. You know, it's a worker to worker kind of thing. And, you know, as a worker, you could say, well, I'm afraid of a just transition, you know, and, you know, will it do this or will it do this? Or how did you um, work out the details so that it wouldn't impact, you know, my job, my bottom line, my money, that kind of stuff. So that they could talk directly to workers that can do that, that have been going through that process. So that's some of our goals. Other goals that we have, uh, are we are in lockstep with our sister um, network, which is the Indigenous Environmental Network, who is who had fought and defeated the Dakota Access Pipeline, and is now on line three, which is called um, you know that's what I that's what it's called <laughs> the line three, which is another uh, heavy crude bitumen um, shale type process that's bringing that is pushing oil from Canada into the US through indigenous lands. And what we're saying is under the UN process, there's this article six and it's really hotly debated right now. And it basically what we want is to give indigenous peoples the right to free prior and informed consent. That means that before you impose something on a, on a tribe, on, a, on an indigenous territory, Folks have to have free prior and informed consent and they have to give you the consent. It's not just do it and think about it later. Thank you. So sort of, thank you uh, again for coming to speak. Uh, 
uh, speaking with us. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you sort of regained at the end about the informed consent about the indigenous tribes, but I was also wanting to go back a little bit to your comment about the World Wildlife Fund. And yeah. uh, there's been uh, a lot of obvious discussion about how that there are these uh, faux green uh, new deals uh, that are proposed by people who claim to be environmentalists and they're not radical enough to actually solve the climate crisis. Um, how exactly uh, do you, how do you work with or do you not work with at all uh, these more established climate uh, environmental groups such as the World Wildlife Fund, the Sierra Club that are supposedly on your same side but obviously you have significant disagreements with? So we do work with some green groups. I, I mentioned one, I, you know, um, Annie Leonard, who I was trying to remember her name, who did the story of stuff. She's the head of Greenpeace. We do work with Greenpeace. Um, we do work with the Sierra Club to an extent. We still have to have a further discussion around carbon trading. Um, we do work with the National Resource Defense Council. Uh, in fact, we, from the Just Transition Alliance, just sued, well, not just sued, we sued the Trump administration uh, under environmental justice um, language um, because the, the EPA um, moved away from enforcing environmental regulation because a letter was sent to the Trump administration from the American Petroleum Institute saying that because of COVID, the EPA should just relax all environmental regulation. And we said, that's crazy. We're talking about communities that are already overburdened by breathing problems, asthma and other things. And to ease environmental regulation and that these companies do whatever they need to do, uh, will put us even at higher risk. So we do work with them on, on things. We've worked with them on, on some climate stuff, but mostly, environmental justice, chemical policy, um, worker-related stuff, we have worked with them on. But um, the, the UN piece, so if you, if, when I mentioned the, the, the policy that the Biden administration is pushing around the 50% reduction by 2030, um, that was a format that the Biden administration put together working with NRDC, Sierra Club and others. And we had to have a conversation and say, hey, that's not ambitious enough. You need to come on board and help us push for more reduction. Um, if we're really going to make a dent in this, they need to um, do a, a bunch of things uh, in, a, in a different way. The... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for the work that you do and for being here today with us. I was curious, um, from your perspective, what would be the best way uh, for people to show support for Just Transition and to also make a positive impact in their own communities in regards to environmental justice? So, are you in Chicago, Rosalinda? I am. Okay. So I think the name was said of an organization there. It's the uh, Little Village Environmental Justice or Little Village. Um, those folks there are just like top notch, wonderful. They're leaders in our movement, and they do wonderful work in um, in those community in that community of Little Village and, and such. So also going to them, you know, volunteering, doing work with them. You know, the folks there are wonderful and the organization is wonderful. So that's something you can do locally. Um, if you want to support our work at, uh, or, and the local community's work at, uh, while we're at the UNFCCC, on November 6th, we're, call, we're, calling it, we're calling for a global day of action. So that means that we're trying to get uh, communities throughout the planet to take that day and say, hey, we, we um, refuse to um, adhere to the false solutions and we want things that literally will bring um, prosperity and health and environmental stewardship to our communities uh, throughout the planet. So we have, uh, I sit on an international uh, organizing committee for the UNFCCC outside 
delegation piece, which is like the civil society side. Um, and I think there's over 50 countries that have already uh, committed to doing that. And when I say 50 countries, I'm not talking about governments. I'm talking about organizations within those countries that have, in some essence, uh, instances like La Via Campesina that has, you know, 3 million members, um, you know, folks in, in Brazil from uh, Comunidad Sin Techo, which are the landless people, um, you know, they have 4 million members. I mean, folks that have been organizing for years and years and years, we're trying to get folks activated to do, but give it your own spin, you know, as a young person. You know, what is the obligation of the leaders in those communities? What is the obligation of the government? You know, what are the obligations of other young people as well, right? And how can we get folks to commit to doing something? I think, you know, I, I read some sobering news. Um, you know, this is from scientists from the UN, <laughs> which I, I, I learned today that there's a political side of things and then there's a scientific side of things. But the political part of it kind of is the one that yields the power within the UN process. And the scientific is kind of falls back a little bit. Um, but there's there's data, you know, that one, one more degree Celsius, we're gonna start seeing uh, more and more starvation. Uh, two degrees Celsius, we're gonna start seeing folks, um, you know, uh, major, major, uh, 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 like, really major um, uh, climate catastrophe pieces happening. Three, we're gonna start going into what is called a, uh, an evolution into what's called the sixth ex extinction, All right? So yeah, and believe me, I don't care what the, Steve Bezos does or whoever it is that's looking for another planet, and you're gonna save us. Thank you so much. In fact, one of the one of the the, the most famous things uh, within the UNFCCC and the outside marches that happened in France and other, there's a sign that for, will forever be ingrained in my in my my brain. And it was just a very simple sign that says there is no planet B. Yeah, there is, um, there is someone uh, who wrote on the chat, this is very sad to hear, right? Yeah. Uh, it is very sad, it's very alerting, right? But I also think, you know, uh, what you have shared with us, Jose also shows all the creativity, right? The communities, right? And commitment the communities all over the world um, are doing to, to make sure that, uh, that we bring uh, um, fair and, and, and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. So uh, I think while well, we, we think that this is sad and, that it's, and the crisis is so big, right? Um, you know, it's up um, to all of us to take part of, um, uh, of uh, getting involved in the movement. And I always, you know, I remind myself and others that the planet will be here. The planet is not gonna go anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It will become a different planet. It's just the humans and the ecosystem is gonna look very different, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to me, the sad part is that we have the tools and we have the knowledge now to be able to stop this, right? It's, it's yeah. unfortunately, it's, it's a political, right? Situation mm -hmm. uh, now that is really uh, creating all these barriers to, to, yeah. to move forward. You know, there's a question in the questions and answer piece in, that I wanna get to. It, it's from an anonymous attendee that says, how does racial environmental justice look like in Mexico? What's the differences mm -hmm. with environmental justice here? Um, in, there is no term in Mexico called yeah. environmental justice. Um, it, it's starting, but hardly anybody uses it. But here we use race as the number one indicator. I'll, I'll go through the four indicators that, that are used in the United States. So race, remember the mapping, income, political clout, and zoning. Mm -hmm. Those are the four indicators that 
put our communities in the situation that we're in now. In Mexico, it's about class. Mm. It's more around class. It's the people that don't have resources are the ones that get dumped on. And the ones that have resources are the ones that could buy their way out of danger. Um, the other piece is when it does look racial, it literally falls by the side of how racism is used against indigenous people in Mexico um, because of many, many ways, right? Violence, um, just, I mean, it's, it, it, it is very racialized when you look at the difference between indigenous people and non-indigenous per se in Mexico. But people don't understand that most people in Mexico that are born in Mexico to Mexican parents and things like that have a line that in their in their in their DNA that's indigenous, but refuse to acknowledge that. Yeah, I think we um, we have come to uh, uh, to the end of the program. We could be here for at least another couple of hours with you, Jose. Um, and we really hope that we can bring you back at some point, but we're also looking forward to uh, what Great Cities is going to be mm -hmm. uh, doing soon. So I just wanna make sure, I don't know if Teresa is still around, but to, yeah, to, to, to put on the chat again where people can find the information for, uh, for their summit. Um, so yeah, so again, Jose, thank you so much for sharing your personal story, how you open up uh, your presentation about your family experience with uh, environmental tasks, uh, and also helping us connect the dots between the environmental justice uh, and labor movements, um, what this collective effort is doing to, to build a sustainable planet uh, and economy that make life more secure for uh, our families, right? Um, and I would like to thank the students again for facilitating the conversation with, uh, with you, Jose, uh, also the LCC staff, and uh, of course, to all listening uh, uh, for sharing a space, uh, curiosity, and purpose, um, which we need to build and sustain collective actions, right? Uh, to ensure that bold and equitable climate policy solutions are put in place uh, to benefit working class communities. So as we live today, uh, we should not be sad, we should be really more uh, excited and more right, infused with energy uh, to understand that we all have a role to play in this and we have no choice. Uh, to put it uh, bluntly. So um, I hope um, all of you attending can join us in our next Climates of Inequality presentation, uh, which is a schedule for Wednesday, November 3rd. Uh, our guest speakers uh, will be from the University of Maya West, Puerto Rico, uh, and they will talk about the ways in which uh, frontline communities in the island have created responses to climate disaster. That's so right. Here, I think we're also going to be looking at some, you know, creative solutions coming from uh, uh, frontline communities yeah. to deal with uh, this disaster. Um, you can register in the LCC website, uh, where you will also find the recording of all the presentations. Uh, give us about a week and then uh, the presentation with Jose will go live um, uh, at that time. So again, uh, thank you everybody and have a, a safe and wonderful evening. Thank you everyone. Thank you.